Good evening all, and welcome. I hope you're comfortable in the forest. I've heard that there are all manner of cryptids roaming around. Black-eyed children, skinwalkers, and more, hiding away in the deep woods. So get comfortable, and let the darkness take control. I had a shitty summer. The kind of summer that makes you question what you're doing with your life. Why you love the things you love. And how crummy the world can really be. And it's something I still feel uncomfortable about. I began working at a summer camp several years ago. I had history as a camper at this camp. And I loved the place. By the time I was 19... I had done what I had never imagined I'd do and become the camp's one and only medic. As medic, I no longer hang out with counsellors and other young staff as much. If I had free time, I spent it helping out in the kitchen. This year there was a big staff turnover. Our long-time cook moved on from camp and no one was hired over the year as a replacement. So... Come summertime, we were scrambling to find someone to cover the position. I met two of the interviewees, one a middle-aged woman who, in my humble opinion, seemed like the perfect, get-it-done kind of person who you need as a cook, and the other, a tall, bald man, mid-forties, with piercings galore, and a loud, look-at-me personality. Looking at you, Mr. Meeseeks. The woman I fancied was not chosen. I think my boss was upset by her surprise when she saw how small our kitchen was. Two ovens to feed 150 people. And the camp was introduced to our new cook, Chef Vincent. Everyone loved Chef Vincent, except for me. The instant I met him, I got chills down my spine. You know when you hear a strange sound in the dark and your body is screaming at you to run or hide? That's how I felt every second I was in the meal hall or in the kitchen. Soon, the places that had been like a second home to me were feeling less comfortable and more, get me the hell out of here creepy. Chef Vincent was abrasive. My first time speaking with him, he said something like, That's your medic? in response to my colour-dyed hair. He tried to be fancy, but his meals were dull and soggy. And after watching him prepare one, I stopped eating them all together. I don't think the man had gone to school in his life, let alone taken a food safety course. I survived off an occasional bite of food on the table and ate packaged crackers, bread and things that he didn't handle directly and a storage of cheap meal replacements and drinks in my room. It sucked. I am an extremely protective person, especially of my younger co-workers, who are basically family. Chef Vincent's kitchen staff were 16 or 17 years old, and I was afraid for them. I'd watch from outside the kitchen and talk to them, discreetly making sure that everything was okay. Honestly, at this point, I was worried about being unfair, since everyone else loved him. Maybe I was the creep. But I couldn't get over the comments that he made and the way he spoke to me. He would touch my shoulder and stand all tall when leaning over me when he spoke to me and told me about how his kids and how they have to stay with their grandma now and about how many years he had of experience, which I always suspected were due to being a prison cook or something like that. He was extremely arrogant. It's not my fault I'm better than the old cook. I just am, he would say. And I wanted to punch him. But eventually, I just stopped going to the kitchen and even stayed away from the mess hall unless others were in there with me. If he tried to talk to me, which he did, often at nights on the deck, I ignored him and left the room. But I still thought I was being a bitch, to be honest. 
Then, Chef Vincent told one of the kitchen staff to really molest that, in reference to stirring a pot or whatever. One member of the kitchen staff came crying to me about how much he was pushing them in the kitchen. Soon, all three of the kitchen staff were describing ingredients of complete disrespect. His refusal to learn their names, use of inappropriate words, and calling them his little girls, and calling the boy all sorts of names. This pushed me, until I told the boss how uncomfortable it made me. I didn't bring the kitchen staff into it, since I advised them to tell their boss on their own. Then one day, a fellow member of staff came up to me and said that Chef Vinson said I won't stop following him and that I should be dating him. Confused and angry, I followed up with another staff member who said that Chef Vincent was talking about the camp dog. Still concerned, I continued with my day when Chef Vincent called me out and told me the story, laughing with a hand on my shoulder the whole time. He also made vile sexual innuendos constantly. Oh yeah, I like things hot, and complimented me, more than inappropriately. I got chills every time. This had been going on for a week. In the second week, I'm asleep in the medic's cabin. It's got a bedroom separated from the rest of the office by an unlockable door, and I'm the only one who stays there. My nights are long, lots of sick campers and whatnot, and on this particular night, it's 4am, and I've finally gotten to bed after being up for an hour with a sick kid. I'm exhausted, and I'm asleep the second my head hits the pillow. Two hours later, I'm awakened by a loud thumping at the door. Usually staff use the walkie-talkies to contact me, even at night. So I'm pretty concerned, and I crawl out of bed and head to the door. It's Chef Vincent. I hesitate, not wanting to open the door for him, so he hammers on it again. He looks angry. I'm angry. It's 6am. What does he want? Finally I open the door just to crack and look out. He's loud. I have to do laundry. My office houses the washer and dryer for the camp because I do laundry when kids wet the bed, so every morning laundry is reserved and staff need to ask me to use it. This particular week, we'd had water problems, and the laundry couldn't be done, so I had a lineup of camper things that needed to be washed, and he was here at 6am demanding he use the wash. When I pointed out the water issues and how camper stuff comes first, he got aggressive and yanked the door open. He's big and intimidating, and I stepped back to avoid him looking, and then he said, I am the important one here. I went cold. It was 6am. I had just been told by this creature from the depths that I, who worked at the camp for five years, was unimportant compared to him. It's hard to convey body language second hand, but he was aggressive, to the degree that I flew past my usual responsive to this kind of situation, anger, and went straight to fearing for my safety. I can be an anxious person, but I don't get genuinely frightened by a lot of things, so what scared me more was how scared I was. My hair was on end, adrenaline pumping scared. His gaze was absolutely predatory, there was nothing about his presence that made me think he saw me other than something to be toyed with. At this point, my mouth was opening, and I knew I'd say something I regret saying, especially locked in the building alone with the one man who creeped the shit out of me from the second I met him. So I forced one word out, okay, and backed away to my room. He watched me the whole time. I got to my room, and the tears pushed from my eyes. But I'm too tired for them to actually come. I am tired of this frustration, of this anger, of this fear. I warned my boss about him, 
boss was always saying to listen to your gut. And I was. But did they do anything about it? No. I pushed a chair against the doorknob, not knowing if it actually works to lock doors like it does in the movies, and curled up in my bed. I told my boss the following morning, and they called it inappropriate, and said that it wouldn't happen again. But that was all I heard. For the next week, I lived in constant anxiety, which meant puking a lot and hiding in my room. When he talked to me, he had a smile that would make even the most daft of people pause for concern. While before this, I had attempted to be polite. I always just left from then on. That week, all our staff were upstairs, save for a few staff monitoring the kids in their cabins. I was called over by a fellow upper level staff member, who informed me that Chef Vincent was fired. His police check, which they didn't decide to do until after he was hired, came back. He didn't pass his vulnerable sector check, aka he was not allowed to work with or volunteer with kids in any capacity due to prior crimes and I'll let you mull that over. Camp was effectively on lockdown whilst he was to vacate the premises. I lost it. The tears came and wouldn't stop and I couldn't breathe. My whole body went fuzzy and I was let out of the building by another upper level staff member where I managed to garble out some stuff along with the lines of he'd made me so anxious and no one else saw it. I'm just so relieved. The panic attack lasted for a solid 30 minutes. When I saw him exit the building with his belonging, I hid in my office. And when I came out, he was gone. They kept it all under wraps. They didn't tell the kids that the cook had gone. They didn't tell the parents just in case something had happened. My boss didn't even tell the board of directors. It was a huge liability, and it still is. And whilst I'm glad that my anxieties about the man were completely justified, I am filled with anger over the fact that he was hired without a criminal record check, and the fact that my feelings were repeatedly dismissed. Camp went from being the only place in the world where I felt completely safe and comfortable, to a strange place where I felt I was living a never-ending nightmare. I felt inadequate and constantly upset. It's funny how having your fears ignored can make you feel as if there's something wrong with you. Eventually, I couldn't take it anymore and quit on account of my mental health, so I could see a professional more often. I still have fears about the man finding me, which I feel is irrational because he never actually abused me or anything just made me feel like shit with myself and made me feel anxious and was incredibly aggressive and oversexual. My parents joke it about it being a Cape Fear kind of situation and laughing about it makes it feel better, but only for a little bit. I don't think they realized just how terrified I was and still am. So creepy chef with a criminal record and predatory eyes who decided to spend his summer working at a kids camp Let's not meet again. Let me preface this by saying, I am by no means a writer, just a domestic engineer living in North Texas. Also, I don't believe in paranormal ghosts, demons or aliens or whatever. However, I did have an event happen to me this Halloween. I have to admit, it's had me scratching my head ever since. So it had been a slow trick or treat night in our neighborhood that evening, which is pretty odd in itself. We usually have kids from different areas drop off in ours and constantly parade at our door. That night, I'd say we had no more than eight to 10 groups of kids. It was around 9.30 and my husband and I were sitting in our family room watching some of the ghost shows based on, supposedly, actual events. Like I said, I don't believe in that kind of stuff, but I do like a good ghost story now and then, and it is Halloween after all. We hadn't had any activity at the door in over half an hour. 
it was getting late, so we decided to turn the porch light on and let our dog Chloe out of her crate. Chloe is an American Bulldog and is very docile. We only put her in the crate because we were afraid she'd try and get out and play with all the other kids and I didn't want to have to chase after her down the street. I also didn't want her scaring or intimidating the kids because she can be a little scary. So I turned the outside light off, let Chloe out and she followed me back to the couch and lay down on my feet. It was getting close to 10pm when my husband decided he'd had enough fun for the night and was going to go upstairs, take a shower and get ready for bed. After all, it was Thursday and he still had to get up early for the next day. Our teenage son was out with his friends at the local haunted house and wasn't expected back for at least another hour or so. So that left me alone on the couch with Chloe. Now, just because I don't believe doesn't mean that those shows don't freak me out a bit. And being alone now, I have to say I was kind of on edge watching the TV. It wasn't long until I heard the upstairs shower turn on when the light came on in the patio. Knock, knock knock at the front door. My initial reaction was, what the hell? Really? It's almost 10. Go home. But soon an uneasy feeling came over me. Why the knock? Our doorbell glows in the dark and without the porch light, it would have been extra obvious to everyone there. I paused. I couldn't really just ignore it. Our front door had a big, glass panel and everyone right by the door could easily see inside and know that I was just sitting there watching TV. It would have been rude for me not to answer. Just before I get up, knock, 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 again from the door. I glanced down at Chloe, but she was gone. My gaze followed her usual path to the front door expecting her to be on her way there as she normally does. Nothing. She wasn't there. I stood up to look around the room and found her crouching by the back door, like she was wanting out. However, she needed to ask to go out like that. She always comes to lick my hand or puts her head on my knee. This was very out of character for her and I have to say it heightened my anxiety. Chloe, crate, I said. She just turned back to look at me like, hell no lady, I ain't moving. I yelled up to my husband, but if he was already in the shower, I knew there was no chance of him hearing me. Knock, knock, knock. About the time a car drove by our street and cast enough light on the door, for me to see the silhouettes of two small children through the glass. I instantly felt relief. It was just some kids, probably a couple of my neighborhood on their way back home and wanted to stop by and show me their costumes or something. I headed for the door and looked back to make sure Chloe wasn't following. What a great watchdog I thought I had to myself. She just sat there. I turned on the porch light when I got to the door and sure enough I could see through the glass. It was a couple of pretty small kids. A little late for such young ones I thought, and began to wonder about what kind of parents would let their kids run around the streets this late at night. I opened the door, enough to see where I could block Chloe's escape if she decided to grow some balls, which was only about two feet. What struck me immediately as odd was that the kids weren't wearing any costumes. They were wearing normal street clothes. Also, no customary trick or treat either. I began to feel very uneasy. It was a girl and a boy. The girl to my left was older, I'd say around 11 or 12. I could tell she was blonde, but I couldn't make out any distinct features as our lights are from high above and on the columns at the front of the porch. So most of the light was coming from behind them. I had not opened the door wide enough for any of the light to come inside and hit them. The boy was younger, about a foot shorter, and between eight or nine I'd say, and looked to have light brown hair. 
The girl very politely spoke up. Ma'am, can we please come inside and use your phone to call our mother? As she spoke, something in the pit of my stomach was telling me that something was wrong. What kid, even at that age, doesn't have a cell phone of their own these days? I couldn't remember the last time I'd had anyone ask me to use my home phone. Uh, hun? Don't you have a phone of your own that you can call your mum on? I asked this, and that is when things got really weird. Both kids turned to look at one another, as if they were going to say something, but neither ever spoke. They both turned back to me and the girl said, Ma'am, my cell phone battery doesn't have any charge left in it. Can we please come inside and call our mother? We're alone out here, and my brother is scared. I have to admit, there were two competing feelings going on inside me. The first, that of a mother's heart and wanting to help these two small children get to their mother. The other, a sinking fear in my gut that was keeping the other feeling at bay. It was then I noticed that during the short conversation I'd already opened the door a few extra inches, which I was completely unaware of doing. I stopped. Honey, why don't you give me your mother's number and I can call her myself? Another pause, and they looked at each other again. After a short moment they turned back to me and the girl said, Ma'am, my little brother has to use your bathroom. Can we please come inside whilst you call our mother? And with that last statement, the little girl moved closer to the door, almost as if she was going to walk in. As she did, she stepped into the light coming from inside the house, and I got my first real good look at her. Solid, jet black eyes. That's all I could see. That motherly instinct was gone and replaced by terror I don't think I've ever felt before in my life. I could feel every hair on my arm and back of my neck standing at tension. I closed the door to where my face was just able to stick out. The little girl stopped again and pleaded, Please ma'am, we're really scared and alone out here. We have to come inside. Please, help us. Then, like on cue, both kids began to whimper and cry. That's when the fear took over, and I shut and locked the door. I'll call your mum if you give me the number I shouted through the door, but I'm not letting you in my house. I could still see them standing there on the porch, just staring at me through the Bellevue glass pane. Part of me wanted to run upstairs to my husband, but the bigger part didn't want to lose track of where they were. That would have freaked me out even more to know that they were not there. After what seemed like forever, but probably a few seconds, I decided to call my neighbour that lived across the street as I made my way to the side table by our couch to get my phone. I glanced back to the door. Chloe was nowhere to be found. We later found her in the guest room under the bed. When I got my phone and started to look for his contact info, it was when the kid had stepped away from the door and had began walking into the street. As they did, I walked to the door to get a better look of who they were and where they went, still not calling my neighbour. If you get close enough to the glass, you can see out enough detail to make up people's shapes, but you couldn't see much detail. Of course, standing that close to the door would make you pretty obvious to anyone looking in. From the door, I could see that the kids were standing under the street lamp, nearest my house staring at me. As I lifted the phone to my ear after calling them, only then did the kids start walking down our street. I met my neighbour out under the lamp once he was out there, but the kids were nowhere to be seen. Like I said, I don't believe in any of this stuff and had never even heard about black eyed kids before talking to my friend. What I really think, what I have to think, is that these kids were just yanking people's chains on Halloween night. 
But I will say this for them. They were really, really good at it. And they scared the shit out of me and my dog, black eyed kid or not. A couple of years ago, my girlfriend and I were camping in the Pacific Northwest between San Francisco and Portland. We had rented a car and were stopping at different campsites every night on our way from the former to the latter. The first night we arrive at a campsite, we find that it had been closed for the season, despite the fact that we looked on their website and they say that they were open. So we ended up driving around, looking for another campsite on Google Maps. But at this point, it's getting dark. We see a forest firefighter outpost and pull in to ask them if they know of any nearby. They tell us that most of them are closed for the season, but there are a couple on their old map that we haven't checked. We get back on the road and find our way to one of these campsites. The sign for this place is literally resting on the ground and is a little overgrown. But at this point it's dark as hell and we really don't have many other options. As we pull our car in to what we think is a spot, we see a few other tents nearby, so we take it as a good sign. We get out and start to set up our things, when immediately, things begin to get strange. Two guys walk directly through our spot and strike up a conversation with us. Both are looking a little rough. One of them has a zip up hoodie without a shirt underneath. And I notice that he is extremely skinny. They're also both really dirty and have messed up hair. But hey, we're camping. They're both speaking very fast and seem kind of nervous. They tell us that they're actually seasonal workers nearby and are staying at this campsite to save money whilst they're there. Whilst we're talking to these two guys, a decade old white Mercedes pulls into the campsite with all four windows blasting rap music. The driver and passenger look like some real ICP enthusiasts. They look around quickly and leave immediately. At the time, I thought they were probably looking for a campsite too. The two rough dudes also leave and we continue setting up camp. Not too long after we get another visitor. This time it's an older woman with a three pack a day voice. She's nice enough, but also asking us some pretty weird questions. You guys here for the horror show? She asks. I'm thinking, what's a horror show? Do you mean the haunted house lady? She tells us that lots of people come out for the horror show and starts warning us about all the ghouls and zombies. She eventually leaves and my girlfriend and I agree they must be talking about some kind of haunted house nearby as it was early October. And you know, maybe that's where the seasonal worker dudes who looked kind of scary happened to be working at. It all checked out in my mind. We start our fire and I begin breaking out the wood when my girlfriend admits that she's freaked out. She's worried about the people that we've encountered and how strange this campsite is. She points out that there aren't really any sounds coming from anyone else's tents, with the exception of the one woman who wouldn't stop coughing. No music, no children, laughter, nothing. I'm starting to believe her. But at this point it's pretty late and we don't really have any other options. I'm also thinking that if the campsite is weird, it's just some harmless weirdos. She seems pacified by my confidence and we continue making dinner. It's at this point a bunch of really weird shit starts happening. The two dudes we met right when we got there emerge from the woods without any source of light and without saying a word, walking straight into their tent. They have a very short and heated discussion which I can't make out. One of them 
storms out of the tent and walks straight towards the older woman's campsite, making eye contact with me for an uncomfortably long amount of time. He then climbs into the cab of her pickup truck, and I realise there's already someone in there, and likely has been for some time, probably the woman. You can tell that they start smoking something from when the lighter flickers. This strikes me as especially odd. You smoke cigarettes in the car? Probably not. Pot? We're at a campsite in Northern California, and I'm pretty sure there aren't any kids around. Why go into the car to do that? Then it hits me like a sack of bricks. It's meth. They were all smoking meth, and the woman was probably dealing. The level of comfort she had established in her campsite indicated that she'd been there for a while. Meth explained why everyone was looking like emancipated zombies. It explained the juggalos driving through, getting spooked and leaving. It explained the strange erratic behaviour and constant coughing from everyone. This was clearly some sort of live-in meth village at a closed down campsite in the backwoods of Northern California. It's at this moment that I realise the second guy is skulking around the edge of our campsite, clearly trying not to be seen. I conceded to my girlfriend that I also wanted to leave. We packed up everything very slowly and normally, trying to make it look like we were just putting away food and putting our fire out for the night. With only the tent left, I tell my girlfriend to get into the car and get ready to back out of the spot. The second I pick up the tent, the woman's truck starts up and her lights turn on. They were blindingly bright circular lights on a rack. I throw the tent into the trunk as fast as I can and I tell my girlfriend to back up. I'm standing behind the car to guide her but also making it very clear to whoever's watching us that I have a hatchet. I was so on edge that if Mr. Rogers caught me off guard, I would have buried that thing into his skull. She throws the car into reverse, hits the pedal and the car doesn't move. I can hear the engine revving and I see the car lurching but it's not going anywhere. For a split second I think they've slashed our tyre somehow. This is how horror movies start. Suddenly it hits me. The parking brake is likely on. It was. She backs up, gets on the main path, and I jump in the passenger seat. As we drive out there, we can hear them start screaming about something. Once we get onto the main road, we do a Chinese fire drill. And I drive down the road at warp speed to the first bed and breakfast that we see. It was lovely. A few years ago, I was driving across the country and stopped at Prairie Creek Redwoods State Park to camp for the night. I got in around 4pm and eager to experience the Redwoods for the first time, started out on a seven mile trail run through the park. This was early November, so I knew that I had about an hour and a half until sunset, which I thought was plenty of time for the run. If you've been to the Redwoods, you know that the terrain is steep, narrow valleys and of course, unfathomably giant trees. Twilight came early, and my pace slowed as the light dwindled. Soon as I was walking, just barely able to discern the path, this was the start of a situation. But I knew that I would be warm enough if I kept moving, so I concentrated on staying on the path and absorbing the forest's presence. It was incredibly quiet. I perhaps heard one or two bird calls the whole time, but not spooky. For lack of a better term, I got a sense of peaceful dignity that existed entirely separate from my human-sized concerns. With maybe two or three miles left in my walk slash run back to the campsite, I rounded a bend and came upon a silvery glowing orb right in the middle of the trail. I held my eyes closed, 
Was this a trick of my night vision into the fading twilight? But the orb was still there when I opened them. After staring at it for some amount of time, I cautiously stuck my hand into it. I didn't feel anything, though I half expected a sensation of heat, or maybe a tingling. But I distinctly remember how the details of my hand appeared in the silvery light. I traced the outline with my hand, but couldn't bring myself to step through it. Eventually I grew cold, and realised I needed to continue. As I was looking for a way around it, I saw the moon just peeking above the ridge. That's when I realised what it was. I had been playing with a moonbeam that disappeared into the depths of the steep valley. The terrain and rising moon had created a sort of illusion that made it look like a glowing orb was floating in the middle of the trail. It was beautiful, yet explainable. I will always hold on to how I felt rounding the bend and seeing that orb. It wasn't fear, just a keen sense of my surroundings with a sudden openness to experiencing something incredibly beautiful, even if it defined my understanding of the world. I was on top of an old, unused, AT&T microwave transmitting tower. You can see for miles and miles and miles up there. I can't remember exactly how tall the tower was, but definitely between 100 and 150 feet. I was replacing a 900 megahertz antenna. The company I worked for was going to start a Wi-Fi broadband business nearby and needed this antenna to transmit the signal over the mountain. We had been up there six or seven times already, and when on the tower, we would regularly see deer. Once I saw a black bear with two cubs. It was late autumn, so there were not a lot of leaves on the trees, giving me a pretty clear view through the canopy. I had just climbed the ladder to the top of the tower, and hauled up the tools and new antenna. I laid down to catch my breath, and ended up just chilling for about 30 minutes. I wasn't in a hurry. When I started hearing some noise from the woods below, a bit further along the ridge, I was just looking in that direction, trying to figure out what was making the racket, when I noticed some animals or something come along the ridge. A group of four huge Sasquatch walked out of the woods and into the clearing by the tower and followed the fence line to the other side of the tower. I guess they didn't see me because they just kept trucking it along the ridge. I'm aware that this sounds crazy and I get that from everyone I've told this story to. To be fair, the things could have been people in very convincing costumes from the top of the tower, it's hard to judge the size of something from the ground without anything around it for scale. My car was on the other side of the small building at the base, and I couldn't see it. So maybe they weren't as large as they appeared. Although, I have no clue why anyone would be in the woods on the top of a mountain, miles away from the nearest road, wearing a giant full body costume. There's not a lot of people coming to the tower to work, maybe once a month at best, and no one knew that I was going to be there on that day, so it makes no sense to plan that kind of elaborate hoax at that location. There are houses relatively close to the tower, but not along the ridge, and either way, whether it was a group of real Sasquatch, or weird people in the middle of nowhere dressed up as Sasquatch. That was not something I wanted to be a part of. I kept my mouth shut, and didn't move for another 30 minutes, and listened, until I didn't hear the sound of them in the distance. I replaced the antenna, and kept as quiet as possible. When I was done, I snuck down the tower, and drove the hell out of there as fast as I could. A few years ago, 
I worked at a Jewish summer camp in northern Georgia. As many of you may know, Georgia is a fairly conservative state, as well as being predominantly Christian. There are a small number of Jewish communities and a few summer camps. I'd say that this summer camp was more culturally Jewish than it was religious. There were no religious requirements, nor specific religious focus. Rather, it was a place for kids who were often in the minority to come to a camp that allowed them to meet some kids like them. Staff came from all over. We had many Australians, a lot of British people, and a few Israelis, and people from various areas of the US. Each night at around 10, most of the staff were able to go out on the town for a couple of hours, whilst enough staff remained behind to watch over the cabins. This particular night, a group of about five of us decided to go to a local bar to grab a few beers. It had been a hot day and was extremely humid that night. Generally, we were extremely well received by the community. Despite differences, we bought in lots of revenue for the town during the summer months. We bought supplies at the local Walmart and often took the campers on tubing trips or occasionally out to dinner after a long hike on the Appalachian Trail. It was midsummer, so we'd been out to the bars in the area many times already that season. The five of us sat around a table drinking and discussing the events of the day, as fellow employees typically would after work. About 30 minutes in, a white man in his 20s comes up to our table. I distinctly remember a jagged scar on his cheek but didn't think much of it at the time. He introduced himself and told us that he was having a party that night at his place. He said, black, white, gay, straight, don't care, just come. I found it odd that he'd open his speech with a disclaimer. Of course, the party should be open for everyone. Why did he feel the need to specify? But we'd all had a few beers and were feeling pretty loose. He talked for a bit longer and nothing really seemed off. We told him we were working at the camp in the local area and couldn't stay, and that we would probably be heading back soon. An hour later, our group went out to the parking lot to get into the car. As we approached it, we saw the same guy come out of the shadows. He had a buddy with him, with a shaved head. His expression was incredibly hateful. His eyes had changed. He pounded his fist into his hand and then took off his shirt and revealed a poorly inked SS tattoo. My stomach dropped. One of the bigger guys in my group, Kevin, immediately reacted by pulling out a knife from his back pocket. At summer camp, most of our staff carried knives because we spent a lot of time building campfires, etc. We asked what they wanted. The original guy started shouting some anti-Semitic remarks and told us he was going to beat us down. Kevin started walking towards the two guys, but we pulled him back. He told us his buddies were on his way, and sure enough, some more guys started walking into the parking lot. It's all kind of blurry here. I remember jumping into one of the cars, pulling Kevin in with us, and it felt like we were surrounded. There were probably only about seven or eight of them. Rocks were thrown at the car, and we sped off. My heart was beating like crazy, and we never went back to that bar. On the bright side, when we told the story to the competing bar in town, the bartender lined up six shots, cheersed us, and said that we'd always be welcome in his bar and in that town. Had no problems in the town itself, but when I took some campers on a two-day hike up the Appalachian Trail, it was another story. On March 4th, 2008, I had my one and only encounter with a black-eyed kid. Before my experience, I had never heard of anything having to do with their black eyes. I was 12. I was sitting outside of a hairdresser's in an old Chevy pickup, waiting for my mother to get her hair cut. 
about 15 minutes had passed, and I saw some kid walking back and forth along the sidewalk in front of my parked car. At first, I thought I recognized him as one of my friends from school, so I banged on the front windshield until he looked my way. When he turned, I realized it wasn't anyone that I knew. At this point, I wasn't scared at all. Not yet. The boy walked over to my side of the car and just stares. I get a good opportunity to look at him, and I am drawn to his midnight eyes. They freak me out. If you have never seen a black-eyed kid, you have no idea what to imagine. Pupils as black as the night sky. The boy whispers, You must let me in. And then I lock the car and duck down into the space below the seats. I heard a light tapping on the window, but I ignored it. And after about five minutes, he was gone. When my mother got to the car, she told me that a boy had gone to the window of the hairdressers and had been asking my mother for her keys. She refused, and eventually he went away. I'm so happy nothing worse happened that day. Tonight, my sister, brother-in-law and two friends and I all piled into a truck and we headed out to the desert near the old Cal Portland concrete factory. About half hour into driving, kicking up dust and messing around, everyone gets the chills and my anxiety starts to flare up. We brush it off as the temperature difference and just keep going. Ten minutes later, we come around a corner and my sister says, please tell me you guys just saw that woman. We responded with, what woman? She says, we just passed a woman standing on the side of the road wearing pink. I think it was a pink shirt. And she had blonde hair that was covering her face. She looked dead. I honestly thought she was messing with me. So we turn around and go to the spot where she saw her. No woman. Brother-in-law and I get our flashlights out and look around. No woman. I tell my sister she's seeing things, and she insists that she saw a woman. So I decide to check my dash cam footage. Sure as shit, there was a woman. She was crossing the road, it looks like, and she just vanishes into thin air. My camera isn't of the best quality by any means, and it was quite dark. But it's clear what we saw. My brother-in-law and I canvassed a two-mile square radius with flashlights calling out to the woman because we legitimately thought that someone was lost out in the desert. The entire time we kept feeling and hearing things around us. Some info to note, this was right next to an extremely murky pond. There is a possibility that her body could be hidden in the pond. I was hiking through the remnants of a remote, long-abandoned town and the surrounding area. To get as far into the woods that I was, you had to cross a fallen tree over a creek three separate times. I had just crossed the third bridge and was about five miles in, and something blue caught my eye just ahead of me. There was a man in his late 60s wearing blue satin pyjamas sitting in a tree. The closer I got to him, the louder he laughed. It wasn't a maniacal laugh, but it set off alarms in my head nonetheless. He also wasn't wearing any shoes and looked very well groomed slash cleaned. I gave him a friendly nod as I passed and he just kept laughing. Then it stopped. I turned and he was gone. No branches cracked, no plants rustled, no sounds were made. He was just gone. Still rubs me the wrong way. The area I was in was pretty rough, very secluded for hiking. Not very many people venture as deep as I did that day. And I still have no idea what was going on there.
I've heard a lot about coyotes and skinwalkers and had a weird experience or two with coyotes. The creepiest being that they went up to my sleeping bag and were sniffing around us without us hearing them during the night. But never anything paranormal, so to speak. My friend Patrick's story, however, kept me going back to a favourite backcountry secret stash. He was leaving the area one morning. He had been camping out there a couple of days and said that there was a coyote that always seemed to be close by. In his peripheral vision, but never overt, he loaded up his truck and started to drive down the washout to the fire road. At the end of the wash, he could see the coyote following him. When he pulled onto the road, it was running next to him. Now he was freaked out, so he sped up and said he was going at 35 or so, and it was running along beside him. Definitely not possible. When he looked back, the coyote was running on two legs and was wearing what Patrick said looked like buckskin pants. An instant later, it was a person wearing a coyote fur, keeping pace with the truck. He looked again and it was gone. We never went back to the grove after that. Too freaky. I am originally from India. My parents sent my sisters and I to an Indian summer camp so that we could learn more about our culture. At the time, I was around 14. I was the standard young and cute kid. I had been going to this camp for a couple of summers, and this particular summer was an important one. The teachers were extremely excited because they had a yoga guru of some sort visiting. I think he was around 60. He would teach us traditional music and dance. He started noticing me right away and kept making comments about how well I was doing things. As the summer continued, I would frequently find him watching me and talking to the teachers about me. Whenever he fixed my pose, he would linger a little too long. These things kept happening and I started to become aware, very aware, of his presence. Flashed to the end of the camp, and it was a couple of days before the ending ceremony. A few girls ran up to me and said that he had candy in his room as he was staying at the camp. They said he would give me some if I went up. I really had a craving for sugar, but I didn't feel comfortable going alone, so I had a few girls come with me. He gave them candy right away, and they left. When I asked for some for me, he motioned for me to come inside his room. I shook my head. He kept trying to get me inside his room. Finally, he gave up after I wouldn't budge, and asked for a kiss in exchange for the candy. Something inside my mind told me to run, and I started backing away and booked it. At the time, I didn't think much of it. I just knew something in that situation wasn't right. I think I told my parents, but never went back to that camp again. In hindsight, it's quite terrifying to think, if I'd have wanted that sugar bad enough, would I have gone to his room? And what would have happened next? Regardless, creepy pedo, let's not meet again. I live in rural Ohio. One of my friends owns a nice barn and farmhouse out in the sticks. Where the buses don't run and where there's absolutely no service. He doesn't actually live there. His family owns the house for shits and giggles. They're millionaires. We'd never ran there before and it's a pretty scenic wood. So we decided that we'd give it a shot. He and I ran cross country and our team went to state that year. So we were in really good shape. We get to his barn and plan on running eight miles near a road and then through the woods. We have GPS watches, so we can make our own path and either turn back at four miles or make a looping path if we desire. 
about two miles off the road, we took a random gravelly road through the woods, and there was a hiking path, so we decided to take it. We live in the country, so it isn't really a big deal. We've done this sort of thing before. I've gotten lost in the woods a few times throughout my high school, but we've never done it here, and we were so far away from home. I didn't run with my glasses, and I'm as blind as a bat. I'm making good pace. When all of a sudden I smack into my friend, I look up, and he's just standing there. I focus in on what he's looking at, and there are bear traps hanging on a branch right in front of us. Looking around, there's more, all blowing in the breeze like wind chimes. Off in the middle, perched up against a tree, there was something resembling a man. My friend pushed me and told me to run. We didn't say a word until we got back to the main road because we ran so fast. Turns out my friend saw what looked like a bloody scarecrow leaning against a tree. In early 2010, I was walking home from work and found myself escorting a young lady to her car. She asked me to escort her and I was hoping that perhaps I'd get the chance to take her out on a drink or two, or maybe even get her number. No shit though, she looked really scared. I kept walking with her, and was trying to get out of her what she was so worried about. She would only comment about some really creepy looking kids that were following her. Being that we were in downtown Seattle, this could amount to anything. So we kept walking and talking, and I looked behind us to see if the kids are anywhere near. Nothing out of the ordinary. Then she grabs my arm really hard and whispered, That's them. They are about half a block in front of us, and standing there looking at her. So I do the prudent thing, which was to cross the street. I make sure I lock eyes with the big kid, and I keep in mind once I get to the lady's car, I'd give them an earful about being a couple of little shits for scaring a lone woman in a metropolitan area. I didn't get scared or anything, but did notice something strange. They didn't break eye contact with me. Mind you, I don't look like the kind of guy who you'd want to mess around with. Honestly, it's an unconscious front since I'm a bit shy, but my look Reminds people of either a skinhead or a club bouncer. The black tanker boots and a bit of Van Dyke mixed in. Doesn't make me look like a people person either. People break eye contact with me constantly. And these two kids didn't. That was a red flag. I finally got the woman to her car and she thanked me. I made sure to tell her where the local police station was. That was only about five blocks away from where we were. She drove off and I went over to see the kids. Just as I was approaching them, I locked eyes with the tallest one again. But that's when I noticed. His eyes were pitch black. I stopped in my tracks, and did not know how to proceed, my mind being overwhelmed with information. This was wrong. I looked down at the other one, he had black eyes as well. I started to feel seriously uneasy. And even though it's not in my nature, I decided at that moment to just walk away. I turned around and left. I'd heard about the black eyed kids, and there was no way in hell I was going to start a confrontation with one of those. I swear down, that's probably the scariest experience of my life. On a two-week solo backpacking trip, I had four days in seclusion between ranger station check-ins. On the first day of the seclusion, I felt like I was being stalked. I lay in my tent that night, and I could hear what sounded like footsteps around my camp, but nothing came close. In the morning, I checked all around and found no evidence of footprints or having any wildlife around me. I broke down camp, and took off trying to put it behind me. The second night was the same thing. I grew so paranoid, 
that when I couldn't hike during the day, I would go over rocks and walk through streams. Anything to try and break the trail so that I couldn't be tracked. I'd go around a blind turn, and then sit there for an hour, waiting to see if anything would come up behind me. At night I couldn't sleep for more than 10 or 15 minutes before waking up. Finally I got to the ranger station check-in, and told them what I had been experiencing. I went and set up camp as close to the station as I could, and later the rangers offered me to sleep on their couch for comfort, as I could actually sleep. I accepted and stayed the night indoors. I walked out to my camp in the morning, and it had been destroyed. My tent was cut on the sides, sleeping bag ripped apart and turned inside out. The rangers came to report it, took pictures of everything, and I ended up getting one of the rangers to give me a ride back to base camp, so that I could go home the next day. Not sure what was stalking me, but it scares me shitless to this day. I grew up in a very rural area of the Deep South, and spent most of my time riding horses alone in national forests and expensive private properties that bordered our house. There was an old abandoned house, two miles ride through the woods from me. I often rode by it on my journeys through the woods, Sometimes I tied my horse up, went inside and explored. But there was nothing really of interest. There was just trash, and things that looked like electricity bills from the 80s. I think an old woman used to live there based on some pictures that I found. Time went on, and I went away to college, taking my horse with me. I no longer rode past this abandoned house, after graduating my college and my horse and I moved back home for a little while and I decided to go back to explore the area again. So I rode my horse the two miles through the deep woods to get to this house, which itself is probably a thousand feet from a lonely gravel road that cuts through the forest. It is very secluded and almost creepy. The house is about three miles away from a paved road. I am less brave than I used to be, so when I entered the house I felt out of place, and slightly scared. But I used my cell phone light to explore the rooms anyway. A lot was just as I remembered, but right as I was about to leave, I found half a skeletal calf in the corner of the entry room. I have no idea how the calf got shut inside a building. The doors were firmly shut when I approached it, and also the screen door opened one way, so it was impossible for both to be open at once, for some creature to accidentally wander in. Furthermore, the nearest cow pastures were a good bit away from the house. I left the abandoned house with the image of my head of some deviant, cruelly trapping a calf in there for sick purposes. I hope I never have to meet the sickos who did that. It almost felt like a dream. I woke up to my dog Lucy barking. She was upright on the bed where my husband and I were sleeping with our 22 month year old daughter. Staring at our door like an unknown stranger was out there rummaging around. I thought she was just freaking out over a house noise. We'd only had her for three months and she was still a puppy. It could have been anything. Our roommate, a creak from the house settling, the awnings moving outside in the breeze. I wasn't too concerned initially. I decided the best thing to do would be to open the door and show her that nothing was there. It sounds a bit silly, but that's what we do with our daughter when she gets scared. And I figured that it would work with a puppy too. I opened the door, and she raced to the front door. She stood there snarling. It was an angry, violent growl, one I had never heard her make before. I looked groggily at her, and opened the baby gate blocking the doorway, planning to open the door and show her that everything was okay. 
The second my hand reached for the deadbolt, Lucy went wild. She started barking and jumped towards me, and when I touched the metal, she suddenly changed her temper. She whimpered, almost like she was afraid and backing down. As her mannerisms changed, so did mine. I wasn't calm anymore. My heart was racing and sinking at the same time. I had been flooded with a mixture of fear and dread. I looked through the peephole. I can't explain why I looked, but I did. Outside were two kids. One was only just a smidgen shorter than I, and didn't look much younger. I'm 21, and she looked to be around 16 or 17. She was slender and pale. Her hair was a light shade of honey blonde, and she wore it long, about mid-back with long, thin, blunt bangs in the front that covered most of her eyes. She wore jeans, a light wash that's popular right now, and a thin-looking, olive-coloured pullover-style hoodie. She held the hand of a small girl, who looked to be around the age of four or five in the same style jeans and a button-down ivory cardigan. The smaller one looked at the floor shyly, but had the same shade of hair tied back in a ponytail. She held a stuffed toy under her free arm, and it was identical to one my daughter has, as was the style of dress. Had it not been for the feeling of overwhelming dread and fear, I probably would have asked these children to come in, as well as given them a hot beverage to get them out of the bitter cold. Something about them seemed off. At this point I hadn't made any noise. I hadn't hushed the dog or grumbled. Nothing. I hadn't turned on any lights. Those kids had no indicators that I was at the door. And yet, the older one spoke. She had a voice that was mature, confident, strong, and accentless. She held her head tilted downwards, and I could see her eyes. She said, we have to use your phone. I stood frozen in fear. How did she know that I was there? She raised her head to face me directly, and that's when I saw her eyes. There was a reason I couldn't see them through her bangs before. They were black, or midnight blue, or a dark, dark purple. But nonetheless, they were otherworldly. She said, our mother is worried. As someone who has always been interested in creepy stories, I knew what she was. The second she looked at me through the door, I have never been one to believe in these things, as a staunch atheist and sceptic when it comes to the paranormal. I had written off many a ghost stories from family members and friends, eager to tell their tale. I didn't believe. Still, I could not rationalise my way out of this. I was standing with nothing but a thin wooden door between me and a black-eyed kid. There was no questioning what was right in front of me. I did not answer her. Slowly and silently I backed away from the door, Lucy still cowering at my ankles. She kept talking. Just let us in and use your phone. I took another step back, and with that step the tone changed. At first she seemed polite, but when I took that second step back, she became commanding, almost hostile. We're not going to hurt you. If we wanted to do that, we would have already broken in. Now, I'll ask you again. May we come in and use your phone? Lucy snarled at the door. I inched backwards, though something inside me seemed to be slowly pulling me back towards the door. It wasn't a physical pulling, so much as a subconscious need to go back and let them in. I went into my room, covered up the window and locked the door, 
and sat in the dim light of the night light. I heard her call me back to the door once more, and then quiet. I didn't go back to sleep that night, and I haven't slept right since. I know from reading about the BEK that they don't come in without permission. I know they haven't hurt anyone, but I fear that I would have been the exception. But this lingering feeling of sadness, this dread when my house is silent at night, this fear of a knock at the door tells me otherwise. It was June 1987, because it was the baseball season after the Bill Buckner disaster. My girlfriend's parents owned the place. It was in southeast Idaho. It was a pretty big place with lots of acreage. The guy who was the full-time caretaker for the place had just quit. And my girlfriend's dad went out there to find a new caretaker. But the new caretaker couldn't start for one month. Her dad offered to pay me $1,200 to go out there. Free food, satellite TV, and all I had to do was keep an eye on the place and feed the dogs and the horse. I had never been out west, so I took him up on it, and it sounded better than doing landscaping. I spent the time reading, exploring, playing the dogs and riding the horse. It was completely uneventful, until that night. After the knocking stopped and dogs stopped barking, I eventually went back to sleep. I didn't freak out that much because there were two German Shepherds inside with me, and I had a gun. I kept it on my nightstand. I had been drinking a little, but was not drunk by any means. There were several neighbours that were a few miles away. I was kind of thinking that someone had just driven down the wrong driveway. Next morning at the crack of dawn, I opened the front door to let the dogs out and see a white Chevy Nova sitting in the driveway. It was near the small cabin for the caretaker. The cabin was around a hundred yards from the main house. I called my girlfriend's dad and asked him if he knew anyone with that make or model of car. He said he didn't and he called the police directly. Police show up, ask me a few questions and walk around the property for an hour or so. The car was locked and the police had it towed. I have no idea if it was broken down or not. There was only one set of tire tracks coming into the house. A few days later, my girlfriend's dad called me up to say the guy who owned the car was missing and to call the police if anything weird happened again. I have no idea who the guy was at all. Don't know how long he was missing or when he was reported missing or who reported him missing. He was just missing. My girlfriend's dad didn't know much about it either. After about a month, I go back home. The girlfriend and I break up shortly thereafter. I see her out of town a few months later and ask her if she ever found out what happened to the guy. All she knows is that the guy was found dead, apparently killed himself 30 miles away. The suicide happened several months after that incident at the house and he was found a couple of days after that he'd killed himself. I asked her how he did it, where he was found and who found him, and I got nothing, and I never saw her again. One night, me and two friends were all walking around at night in the fields of a small town in Michigan. Our destination was a junkyard tucked away behind several fields, home to rusted out cars semi-trailers, farm equipment, etc. We were cutting through the fields to avoid the trigger-happy farmers that live round there. We're near enough there, when we get foiled by a stream too wide to leap. It was late autumn, and wet feet would be uncomfortable, so we backtracked into the adjacent field. From our corner of the field, there was a tree line that ran east to west, and southward, the land rose into a large hill. We stood for a moment, discussing our options, when my eyes were drawn to a large, white boulder, seeming to glow in the moonlight. 
it was around 75 yards away. And I was idly staring at it when we moved. It unfolded, standing up to about 10 or 12 feet. This bipedal skeleton thing of pure white with long limbs. For the space of a second, it looked at us and then took off. I think it was running, but it may have been gliding or flying. Honestly, I'm unsure, but it crossed the field up and over the hill, a distance of probably 100 yards. And in about two to three seconds, in complete silence, it was gone. Only two of the three of us saw it. And after a few minutes of incoherent gibbering, we tried to rationalize, explain and figure out what the hell we saw. We decided that it must be an alien. A year later, I was at a party and the subject of aliens came up. I chirp in, I've seen an alien. Some people reply, yeah, let me guess. In Saranac, right? I confirm. We exchange mutual looks of awe, and he directs me to this Eric fellow, who grew up in said town. Eric tells me that he has seen strange things his whole life. Lights in the sky, etc. But no humanoid beings. Fast forward another year and a half or so, and I get a phone call from an acquaintance, who was sitting at work when he noticed a young girl staring at him strangely. He eventually walks up to him and says, I feel like I need to talk to you. She proceeds to tell him that her friend's dad is the head of a vampire clan in a town near Saranac. My friend remembers my story and weird things in the area, and he asks her if he knows anything about Saranac. She gets very defensive and eventually reveals that Saranac is an alleged breeding ground for dragons. Yeah. To this day, I'm not certain if I saw a dragon, alien or vampire or whatever. But I did a bit of poking around and I heard from a girl that lived there that since she was a kid, she's seen random 15 foot scorch marks on roadsides and in the middle of fields. I'm honestly clueless, but I know what I saw, if only I knew what it actually was. When I was 12 years old, I went to a week-long scout camping trip with my troop. Our campsite was notably isolated from the majority of the other sites. So even though there were hundreds of kids at the camp overall, there were probably five or six of us and two or three leaders in our site. I shared a tent with two other kids. Being the anti-scout that I was, I bought a full-sized cot to sleep on, whilst the other kids slept on the ground. I am a horrible sleeper in any conditions other than my own bed, so I've always taken sleeping pills when I go camping. Sometimes, I have strange reactions to them. Where I don't sleep well, and get dreams confused with reality. On our final night at camp, it was storming with lightning everywhere. We were in a creeped out mood telling scary stories before we went to sleep. I couldn't wait to go home next morning. I took my pills and somehow managed to fall asleep. I woke up a few hours into the night. I could barely make out the crouched over figure of a tall man. I'd woken up because he was gently grabbing my leg. He didn't look like any of my leaders from what I could tell. Confused, groggy, and horrified, I said, What? The figure remained silent. After a week on these sleeping pills, I knew that they could make me confused. I closed my eyes, hoping it was just the pills combined with the night of scary stories. I felt the gentle grip on my leg again. The figure was standing there. What? I said again, and this time more panicked. Suddenly, still without a word, the man leaned down on the ground next to me where I couldn't see him because I was elevated. 
I couldn't hear anything strange happening. But I was filled with so much terror that I couldn't even bring myself to peek over the edge of my cot. I was still unbelievably tired and confused. And in my frightened stupor, I convinced myself that the sleeping pills were causing me to blend nightmares with reality. I drifted in and out of a horrified semi-sleep for the rest of the night, wondering what exactly had happened. I never recalled hearing anything notable or seeing the man leave the tent. And once the sun began to dimly light the tent, I mustered the courage to look over the edge of the cot. The kid next to me was asleep and appeared unharmed. If this were all the story though, I would have dismissed it as a weird reaction to my sleeping pills. But then the next morning over breakfast, the kid who had been next to me asked me if our other tent mate, if someone had gone into our tent overnight. The other tent mate said he assumed one of us was getting up to pee and had gone back to sleep. When we all confirmed that none of us had gotten up in the night, we started freaking out, begging our leaders and the other scouts for them to admit if one of them had played a joke on us, or that they had a history of sleepwalking. Nobody had any idea what we were talking about. I don't know what someone's motives would have been to come into our tent and to gently touch my leg and be silent, unless I have some serious mental blocks. There was no kind of sexual violation that I can recall, just a strange, quiet intruder. I was working in Oregon. I worked for a company that handled the customer service member privileges point of sale systems between Planet Fitness and I was checking in on a few locations. Since Planet Fitness is a 24-7 establishment, I had to cater to all the shifts and would show up to each club multiple times during day or night. At one night, approximately 11.30pm, I was heading to the PF location in Beavington, Oregon. My rental car had Bluetooth capabilities and was currently playing a Coast to Coast AM episode throughout the car speaker. This particular episode was a talk about the gin. I don't know how the topic came on, but I remember that someone brought up the Black Eyed Kids phenomenon and the person who was speaking said that it could be related to the gin. Looking back, that was a serious coincidence because what happened when I arrived to the club chilled me to the core. I'm a smoker. Nasty habit, but it's my vice. When I arrived at the club, I decided to smoke in the parking lot with the driver's side window open on my rental so that I could continue to listen to Coast to Coast and not be in the car because rentals can fine you a couple of hundred dollars for smoking inside. The PF there was an L-shaped strip mall. I don't entirely remember all of the stores in the strip mall, but the Planet Fitness is all the way to the end, and all the way to the left is the pharmacy of some kind. My passenger side was parallel to Planet Fitness, and that was about 30 feet away from a street light. The pharmacy was around 75 yards away, and obviously closed. I was leaning against the car smoking, and playing on my phone, looking up at the pharmacy. In the light of the marquee, I could see two people standing outside of it. For it being near midnight, I thought how weird it was to see someone outside an obviously closed pharmacy. But the thought was fleeting, and I was once again down in what was probably a safe bet. After a few seconds I looked up, I noticed these two people. I could now tell that they were kids or teenagers, and they were about 20% closer than before. It struck me as odd. I didn't see them walking to that spot. They were just looking in my general direction. From this distance, I could tell they were both wearing hooded sweatshirts. They were dark in color, and both kids had their hoods up. They were in the area just outside the street light -like glow. It shone on them, but not enough to see very clearly. Looking back, 
This should have raised some red flags, but I once again was back on my phone. As I was listening to the radio, they were talking about ancient items from the Middle East that seemed to have some kind of evil spirit attached to it. Well now I glance back up and the kids were about 25 to 30 feet closer. They were once again outside the general streetlight glow, but I could see them much clearer. This time, their heads were aimed down. I couldn't see their faces, but I could make out their clothes. One had an olive dab green hooded sweatshirt with no visible markings nor insignia. The hoodie was on the top of what appeared to be a grey ball cap and once again with no markings or insignia. The other one dressed very similar, the only difference being navy blue zip up hoodie and a hood over what appeared to be a black ball cap, khaki pants and white shoes. The kids were standing still. I hadn't seen them move to their current location, as they were almost frozen there, not moving at all. I don't know why, but I just went back on my phone not phased by it. I got a weird feeling almost instantly. I looked up, and they were there. Five feet in front of me, and not moving closer. I tossed the cigarette butt underneath the car. I asked them if there was anything I could do for them. And then they replied, Please kind sir, may we borrow a cigarette? It's very lonely at night. We only need one cigarette. Please. After they'd finished speaking in unison, they slowly lifted their heads to show me their faces. I remember thinking it's kind of late for teenagers to be out on a Thursday. And almost as if they'd just plucked that from my head, I heard... It's quite all right. We have permission. As soon as permission rolled off the second kid's lips, their faces were level with mine, showing me solid, jet black eyes. I froze. My mind was going about a million miles a minute, because damn it, I did know what black eyed kids were. Well, know what they were, but I knew of them. I couldn't move or speak. Their faces were almost the definition of blank, almost because the edges around their slit straight mouths began to curl ever so slightly. But you could see it. The inside of my stomach began to get colder, and with all my might I tried to turn my face but I could not. The second kid took a step forward. The movement of shoes caught my eye, and I broke eye contact. I looked down, and the moment my eye contact was broken, Everything I knew about Black Eyed Kid encounters rushed through my head, and I turned around and ran into the club. Now when I say ran, I sprinted in loafers, and all 6 foot 1, 250 pounds of me screamed the whole way. The young kids who worked at the counter just stared at me when I came in. I tried my best to explain, but they didn't know about the Black Eyed Kids. I looked out the window and they were standing side by side facing the club, motionless. Chills ran down my spine. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. It would mean the world to me if you would show this video some love by leaving a like and a comment, as it goes a long way. And why not consider sharing it with a friend? or someone who you think would enjoy it. Just a reminder that you can get into the holiday spirit with my new merchandise, which can be found in the description, along with the links to my social media as well as my Patreon, if you're feeling extra generous. If you'd like me to read your story on my channel, feel free to send it to my email or share it to my Reddit, which is of course in the description please make sure to include as much punctuation and descriptive language as possible to maximise the chances of it being read. But anyway, for now guys, I'm going to sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.